to another amazing episode of Uncommon Conversations. I'm your host, Jaja C. Hubbard. I hope you missed me because guess what? I missed you and I have another amazing show for you today. Listen, I'm telling you, you don't want to miss out on it. I know you enjoy Ari Lane on last week. Listen, she brought the heat, but I have an amazing brother that's here right now. And ladies, I want y'all to get ready, okay? Because if you thought Ari was doing something with her words, this brother right here is going to set the stage on fire. My guest, Mr. Don McCaskill, also known as Brother Don, is getting ready to shut us all the way down. Listen, this Detroit native is an amazing father. He is a mechanic enthusiast. And listen, ladies, he loves the spoken word. And he's going to get you together, not only with ways to help your life, encouraging words for love, but how we can help our community. Without further ado, help me welcome Brother Don. What up, though, Brother Don? What up, though? How you doing, Jaja? with you as always. Listen, I'm super, super grateful that you could be with me on today. Listen, Don, I'm super grateful because not only have you been working with me uh, behind the scenes, a lot of people don't know this, but you have spoken some really, really great encouraging words into my life. Tell me, Don, growing up in the city of Detroit, what made you tap into your love of words the way you do? So I grew up, uh, I grew up originally in the, in the Brightmore community. And later on in life, uh, uh, we, we moved to Southfield. So it was kind of like a, it was supposed to be like a, you know, moving on up situation. situation. But um, nonetheless, um, I was just always very um, mindful and aware of everything that was going on around me and, and the things that I see. I, I always was, um, I always was, was more so on the uh, like intelligent, like dorky side. So a lot of the things that um, a lot of other, uh, a lot of other kids got involved in, I just, I just really wasn't in it. I wasn't built for it. I wasn't cut for it. I, I wasn't, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and, and the way I look at it is, is I see that God had just a different plan and a different idea for me. And so um, it wasn't until my uh, later formative years, like my teenage years, when I started really uh, typing. I, I had some really uh, tough uh, English teachers, you know, shout, shout out to uh, Miss, Miss Shaw uh, and all of them. But um, I had some uh, English teachers that really poured into me, though, actually, is what they did and, and showed me different things and taught me different things. Um, and and uh, I actually really, really hated writing at first. And um, a, as I continued to do it at first forcefully and then when I got a little older, not so much forcefully, uh, I, I realized that, um, that, that that I had a, a little bit of a gift and a little bit of a talent. And I just kind of um, just continue, continue to go with that. And all I do is write about how I feel and and what I see, and then uh, always my favorite subject to write about uh, is God. Now, tell us, gr growing up in Brightmoor and your household and, and some of the challenges, because you say you didn't like English. You didn't like school and, and some of the things. And like most young black uh, African-American young men, they don't like English or writing or having to express themselves either. What was that like growing up in that community and, and finding and discovering that love? Um, it, it really more so was, um, it was, it was a self-discovery thing. And, and to be honest, it really kind of, um, it really didn't come into play until later on in my life. Like when I, when I got older and more mature and I, and I could, you know, kind of see things from a different perspective and see things a little bit better. But, um, growing up in Brightmore, yeah, I remember, um, I remember, like I said, I, I always definitely, uh, stuck out, stuck out for sure. I didn't, um, I wasn't the most popular person. I, I didn't, uh, I wasn't the coolest kid or anything like that. Um. Um, and, and what I did find out, especially amongst uh, boys and men's uh, boys and men, 
was that uh, I was a little bit more um, I was a little bit more expressive uh, than than I found other males to be. Not just in Brightmore, I mean all over. Even even in my adult life, sometimes I I, I can notice that I'm just a little bit more willing to um, talk about. I'm more willing to talk about things that, first of all, a lot of people don't really want to talk about. I'm a lot more willing to just be upfront about my emotions and my feelings and, and the things that I see. And uh, I mean, I, I just I kind of pride myself of being on just a straight up person. Like I'm just like straight up. I'm, if, if I got Zaza, you know me, okay? If I if I want to know something or if I, if I see something going on, I'm just gonna straight up ask you. Hey, look, what is up? What, did I hurt you? Did I, I mean what's up? What's happening? You know. Um, so that was one thing I definitely noticed uh, when I when, uh, as I was growing up is that yeah, men didn't really seem too interested. Um, and first of all, talking a lot anyway. Uh, and secondly, definitely not too all that interested in talking about um, what I felt like was the uh, was the deeper things. Um, and so uh, that that's how that turned out. And then also, uh, as I think I told you before, you know, I did I did grow up. Uh, it was just me and my mom uh, growing up, and I, and I watched uh, I watched my mom do everything. I watched my mom handle everything on her own. I watched uh, I, I just I just watched her, uh, and I and I took on I took on a lot of that. You know, my mom is the type that like. You know she don't she don't need no she don't need nobody you know what i'm saying get it all her own and so i was never under the uh i was never under the control i i i guess is the word i want to use i was never under the control of really anybody else other than other than my mom wow that's beautiful shout out to all of the strong black women out here that are raising these young black men now don Yes, because, you know, growing up, you, you're growing up in the Brightmore area and you notice that you're different from everyone else. And then you go off to the military. A lot of people have a lot of thought processes when it comes to the military, especially in the African-American community. And in times past of how uh, black people have been portrayed in, in the military, what were some of the reasons why you decided to go there opposed to college? And how did that affect you as an African-American male? Okay, um, so it, um, it, it again, I think it mostly came down at that time in my life. You know, I was uh, I was seventeen or eight, seventeen, eighteen, uh, and at that time time of my life, it really just kind of came down for me mostly was it was the self awareness aspect and it was the guarantee aspect, um, and so uh, I knew that had I uh, tried to go the route of just simply going to college, going to university, and trying to get me. A degree and all that kind of thing. I knew that that would be a, a I knew that that would be a struggle for me. I knew that um, I, I'm very social. I know that uh, you know, just going away, and being alone, and just being surrounded by, by that college environment. I just I just knew that it wasn't going for me personally. For me personally, I I was aware enough to know that it wasn't going to be a conducive environment for me to be productive in the way that a college university. Will want you to be productive. It was actually my mother who suggested the, who just she made the suggestion to me about the military. I don't, I'm not, sh I'm not sure if she actually thought I was going to go or, or not. But my mother was also, uh, my mother was also in the army for six years, um, and so she did make the suggestion to me about the military and said, "Hey, that's an option." And um, as it was coming time uh, to to start applying for colleges, which I did apply to to a couple of colleges, some I got into, some I did not. Um, and all my friends were going to college and things like that. I was like, uh, I, I, I had to figure out something to do. I mean, I, it was it was time. I mean, I either was I knew for a fact I was either going to go to school, get a job, or go to the military. I mean, you know. And by the time April the ninth came around, which is my birthday, and I turned eighteen, I had better have something going on because I it was I had to go. You know what I mean? So. Uh, uh, it's just time to grow up, you know. And you know what's so crazy? I love that you say that because a lot of people don't realize, you know, when you're growing up, you get fed, you know, get good grades, go to college, you get a good job. And and you you're coming out of Brightmore. You like, man, what I'm seeing don't match up with my future. I need to do something. And like most 17, 16, 18, 19 year olds, they do get in trouble around that time because they don't know what they want to do, where they want to go. They end up hanging out on the block, hanging out with the local friends. Now you just a local whatever hanging with whoever so you decide to go off to the military and, and once you get you know how it goes especially for our people once you once you get caught one time it, even if you ain't even do nothing it just by association or whatever 
then it's pretty much over. And and that's what I saw in in in, in Brightmore a lot. I saw a lot of people, and and don't get it twisted. Everybody, you know, people think that uh, people uh, from certain hoods or whatever the case may be are are like ghetto and uneducated and all this other kind of stuff. And that's not the case. There are some for sure. Uh, but that's not the case. What I saw was uh, a community of people where, where everybody was getting up, going to work, and really just trying to make just trying to make ends meet for their family. Now, so many options were presented to you, and you now have this extreme love not only for poetry and spoken word, but you have a love for technology and mechanics. Now, you know, in this world that we live in, technology is the driving force, um, as well as you know the basis of all companies why do you have that love for technology and how has it benefited you in, in your life being from detroit so the love of technology has benefited me greatly 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 um i love i actually uh i was a mechanic for the last like 10 years of my life uh which is hence hence my tattoo my daughter's name i can't even get it on here my daughter's name on it just a wrench i love fixing stuff um uh, i found it to be very useful number one it was an excellent it, it was an excellent way to make good legal money so um I, I i actually started liking cars when i was like 12. i had an uncle that that was in my life that came and uh took me to like race tracks and showed me around cars and i just was immediately immediately like overjoyed and completely just turned on by all of it um and so i like i like cars i like put stuff together and the other thing was i also was, i'm also an only child and so um I just spent a lot of times with my, I spent a lot of quality time uh, with all of my toys growing up. And, and nine times out of 10, any of the toys that I had, I guarantee you, I took it apart and put it back together just out of sheer boredom. Uh, and I enjoyed doing that. I had little tools when I was younger and everything. My, my mom did uh, nurture the things that I, were, I was uh, good at, the things that I liked. She definitely nurtured that. And so most of my toys, all of my toys when I was a kid were either, it was either Legos or Hot Wheels. That was pretty much, that was pretty much it until I got a computer. Then then it was, it was like all about video games. But So to this day, uh, the love of technology, uh, I, I was able to start my own, my own mobile mechanic uh, business, especially during times of hardship, because we all go through times of hardship as, as, as adults, you know, when we're figuring it out. And there were definitely some times of, hard, you know, where I was between jobs and, and, and things of that nature. And I came up with this idea to do a mobile mechanic service. I said, you know, hey, how cool would it be if all these people with these car problems, if, if they didn't have to go all the way to a shop and wait two or three hours and, and all this kind of craziness, what if I just pulled up on them? And, and just while, while, while they in the house making their food or take care of their kids or while they at work or while they at church, wherever they was at. I, I had this idea to just pull up on people, you know, they, they hit me up or whatever. I pull up on them and diagnose the car and, and tell them the price and, and, I, and I'll fix it right there. And that was extremely beneficial for me. I did that for about three years um, and, and it was extremely beneficial uh, uh, for me. And it kept me out of, uh, definitely kept me out of, a couple of times kept me out of homelessness and everything else. So I'm very thankful, very blessed for that. Um, now I work in IT. I work for uh, DPS, and 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 now I get to help the community um, with their uh, with their lab, with all this virtual learning because we're all doing this virtual learning stuff. Whether you're a kid or a person with kids, you got you doing virtual learning. Absolutely. And um, I get to help the people and the parents with their with their uh, issues with their. Uh, the laptops and devices that the district gave out. And you know what, Don, I, I love that you are using not only uh, your military background, your love for technology, your love for words, and you're combining all of those things together. A lot of times people think that they can only do one thing, that they're only born to just love or create one thing and God didn't create us to be that way. He wanted us to do so many things and be fruitful, multiply and do all these great things. Now you being the amazing young statuous black king that you are living in the world that we live in. What is it like being a black man knowing the climate of the politics and knowing the climate of racism and discrimination and knowing the things that you all have to face, you being a black man, me being a black woman, our, our black families. What are your thoughts, um, especially your words when it comes to how you are as a man in this world? There, there, I mean, there's no denying that there is certainly uh, a, a plethora of issues with, uh, with the world and more specifically 
the the American government and, and as far as the way that they treat African Americans and the way that they treat and, and even the way that they treat women, um, you know, with with different different pay wages and the police police brutality every five seconds and you know follow me around in the store when I'm in there all that kind of I've, I mean I've experienced all of that and not only that but in the um, I personally felt like since I spent a decade in the automotive industry. It, it seemed to me as my personal, please don't sue me over nothing, but it, my personal opinion is that it seemed like the automotive industry was uh, at least the, the, the technician, the mechanic, the mechanic side of it was predominantly um, white people. You know, it, it puts you in a pickle because it's like, OK, well, I need this job and I need this money. Um, but this this is kind of this this is uh, affecting me and bothering me. And, and what I ended up a lot of the times doing was just saying, you know, there were times where I spoke out and I spoke my mind and, and what I realized quickly was like, okay, I'm doing that too much because see now I, I keep losing jobs or whatever because I'm flipping out on these white people at my job who keep walking up to me and asking me why they can't say the N word while saying the N word to me. I mean, these are st this is stuff that happened to me on multiple different jobs. And it seemed it seemed like a pattern. It was consistent, and so there was a little bit of a combination of me having to like kind of like play the game, but also um, trying my best to be a good representation of a black person. Now, brother Don, you have had the opportunity of being published in a multitude of books. Uh, you gifted me with uh, the Brown Paper Sugar and a journey for us through God's grace and mercy. Now, tell me about the experience of being a, a published author. You're taking your words from out of your mind and in your heart and you're putting them on paper. And then now you took those papers and you put them in a book. Tell me about how does it feel to know that the young man from Brightmoor that went from to Southfield and military and all these great things is now a published author. Specifically, when it comes to being an author, being an author, I, it still feels weird to even hear that, that I'm a published author, that I'm an author. It's kind of weird to me because it was not anything that was in my plans. I never planned to be a published author. I never planned to be a poet, was never even really thinking about it in, in, until a few years ago. Um, and so and I say that to say that, you know, it, it, it does pay and it it, it, there's benefits in trusting God because God did all of that. And even to this day, this is why I write the poems that I write. And I always include God in my poems because I feel like God gave me the gift of, of words. Uh, despite my, because you know my situation, you know where I came from. And you you even recognize that it's unlikely for a black man to come from where I come from and, and to end up where I end up. And, and, and that's why I say, I know it was all God. It wasn't me because I'm, I'm crazy. <laughs> God guided me through all of this. When people tell me that oh, you're, you're a young black published author, I'm like, yeah, I am, but, but God did it. And so God gave me the gift, and I just give it right back to him. When I write my poems and I'm thinking about what I'm going to say to any group of people, black people, white people, I did, I did a show. Uh, you, well, we met when I did the thing for human trafficking. I mean, you know, that was I make sure that I include somewhere in the poem that, Hey, God sees this as well, and God is also involved in this situation as well. So let's, I don't ever want to, um, like, forget about that. And you know what's so amazing that you brought that up about, you know, human trafficking? Um, it's such an incline in our communities, especially urban communities. And you are a father, you have an amazing, beautiful daughter. And that changed, you know, your your outlook on life, your your outlook on on things, because, you know, some things don't affect us until we develop that role. You know, we, we were at the human trafficking event and, you know, I've never had it affect me personally, but we end up linking up. And because that was a, a importance of people we know and love, it became an importance of ours. Now, you have a daughter. And because human trafficking is, is increased significantly in urban communities, you know, tell me about your love for fatherhood and why it's important for fathers to be involved in the lives of their children. You know, uh, especially in the black community, I mean, we need our fathers. You know, um, one major one major aspect for me, as I mentioned earlier, is that my, my father was was absent. He was he was just not around and he was not even in jail or on drugs or anything. He just simply was not around. Um, and so um, 
for that reason, uh, uh, along with a whole bunch of other, a lot of other reasons, obvious reasons, um, you know, it, it was just, I mean, even when I was like nine, you know, I myself, like, I don't care what kind of relationship situation I have. I don't care what I got to go through. Like, my child is not going to grow up in this on this earth without a father, period. Um, at, at least, I mean, even if her mama try to keep me away, look, she know I exist, but I thank God I don't got none of those kind of problems. Um, and so it's important to me. Um, and, and, I, and the other part that makes it so personal for me is like, I know a lot of people very personally who has, um, they haven't been trafficked, but they have been uh, sexually abused. A lot, a lot of women uh, that I know in my life, you know, just a lot of people in my life have been sexually abused at a young age. And so this is something that really uh, concerns me and, and really, uh, it really just kind of hits home for me. And so um, I just make sure that uh, I teach my daughter, you know, I, I just try to keep her moral compass straight. You know, I teach her the difference between right and wrong. I teach her, you know, uh, about lying and stuff like that. And, and I definitely tell her, I've had a couple of conversations with my daughter and, and just kind of let her know that, um, that, hey, you know, when you're surfing the internet and when you're, you know, like watching YouTube, when you're playing Roblox, when you're doing this, that, and playing Xbox or whatever, because me and my daughter get down on some games, okay? Come holla at us. We, we, we'll teach some lessons. But uh, when she's playing games and stuff like that, I tell her, I say, you know, you have to be careful about who you talk to and, and things like that uh, because, um, you know, there are a lot of people out here who are, who are out to hurt you in ways that I can't even begin to explain to you right now. Absolutely. And I think that that's extremely important when um, a child or children have that love from people who, who genuinely care and love for them. And, you know, this is a very important time because during this pandemic and COVID-19, a lot of people were struggling to, to have that love and to, to find uh, that type of support within their family and in their household because you're confined. You know, we're not normally uh, able to do all of the things that we would like to do. And so that will show when you have to stay at home with your loved ones. Now, how have you been affected during this time frame, during pan this, during this pandemic and during COVID-19? COVID-19 has affected me um, in, the, in the sense of, yeah, having to basically stay at home. And uh, for a while, there was an issue, you know, working because if you're working on cars, you can't, can't do that from home. And so I had to figure I had to figure all that out. But what it did do was give me an opportunity to take a step back and not only spend time with my loved one, uh, with my daughter, um, but it also gave me time to study up on making the transition from the automotive uh, world into the IT world, which is something that I have been wanting to do for years anyway. And so I, I guess that's just my perspective on it. I'm, I'm just looking at it as more of a blessing. I'm not saying that COVID-19 is a good thing. I do understand that, you know, it, it's it's taking people out of here. I mean, COVID is really, it's, it's taking people out of here. And, you know, I make sure I, 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 uh, I take my precautions. And you know what's so uh, beautiful, I love that you said, is that it has definitely taught you how to spend more time with your loved ones and your daughter. And it definitely gave you a different perspective of survival. Now, listen, Don, every time I have a guest on the show, I like to play this little game. Are you down to play? Come on now. You already know I'm down to play some games. All right, cool. So the game I like to play with my guests is called the Survival Kit. I give you three items. You get to use one, you lose one, and you give one away. I'm going to name the three items. You tell me which one you're going to use, which one you're going to lose, and which one you're going to give away. First round. Key ring, a book, toothpicks. Use one, lose one, give one away. Key ring, book, toothpicks. And this is for survival? Dang. Uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, the most useful thing, well, I, the book is definitely the most useful thing, depending on what kind of book it is. But aside from that, I would probably I would probably try to use that key ring for something. I would I would I would take that and and mend it until it's straight and, and try to use it to do, you know, God knows what. So I would use that. Once I don't want to lose it, we can lose the toothpicks. I don't really I, I mean, I'm going to start a fire, but I'm straight on toothpicks. Next round. Flashlight. Bag of oranges, shoes, flashlight, bag of oranges, shoes. Uh, yeah, I guess lose the flashlight, use the uh, 
use the um the orange use the oranges lose the flashlight give away the shoes I don't, I don't okay know. last round a fan cologne a lighter a fan a cologne lighter okay so the fan is definitely gonna have an electromagnet in it so i'm gonna use that <laughs> for something <laughs> I, we can get away the cologne i don't for survival, I just don't think that I need the cologne. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll give the lighter away to someone else who may need to start a fire. Thank you so much, Don, for playing a survival kit with me. Listen, before we get out of here, I want to know, what do you want your your supporters to know about you? How can they support you? What can they look forward to you doing in terms of coming uh, projects coming up? And how can they find you? Okay, so look, you can find me on Facebook uh, as Don McCaskill. You can find me on uh, Instagram as Brother Don Poetry. So that's that's B R U T H A underscore D O N underscore Poetry. Um, and, and you will see a lot of my information on there. Upcoming events, I have. Uh, so book number three is actually already like printed and everything. I'm waiting on Amazon to drop it off at my doorstep. So book number three is is out, and so I'll be I'll be promoting that and selling that real very soon. Um, uh, April seventeenth uh, at the Buick uh, at the Buick Hall on Joy Road. There's going to be there's a poetry event um, that I'm my partner and I, uh, Aquila B Poetry, will also be there. Uh, it's called a Spoken Words Crusade, and it's going to be Saturday, April seventeenth at the Buick Hall. It's a ten dollar entry fee. But look, we're gonna have we got some really really good Chicago poets, and then we have some good Detroit poets. And so we're just gonna. Um, do some live poetry and some testimonies because, you know, we always got to give the glory to God. Listen, I have my guest on the show, Mr. Brother Don in the building. Listen, make sure that you guys go and support Brother Don as he continues to build his international spoken word artistry and venues and events. And make sure that you get out here and grab his newest copy of his books. Listen, that was the power of a conversation. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Listen, I want to hear all about how you feel about the show. Write to me at P.O. Box 27866, Detroit, Michigan, 48227. And if you don't want to write to me, guess what? Send me an email. I want to hear all about it at www.jajachubbard.com and listen, make sure that you follow us on social media at Jaja C. Hubbard. I would love to hear it from you. And listen, if you enjoyed today's show, I hope to see you next week. Peace. All lives matter. Well, let me explain this properly because the concept of race was birthed from the idea of human beings being property. And then the Bible, having fair skin, wasn't even a property. And now the people with the fair skin don't even apply the word fair properly.